All right, so today we're super lucky to have Daniela Witten uh, with us. She is a professor of statistics in the University of Washington. Um, are you also in biostatistics? I think so. I yeah. am, yeah, stat yeah. and biostat. Great, and she is an expert in machine learning, and that's what we're going to talk about today, a popular topic uh, these days. So I, um, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself quickly or, or you want me to go ahead and start with the questions. Yeah, well, um, thanks so much, Rafa, for having me on and to all of you for joining. Um, and I, I really appreciate everyone who's dealing with just this, this crazy world that we're in, taking the time to join this webinar. So that's really nice of all of you. And Rafa, to you for organizing this. It's so fun to have like a, a human connection in the midst of all this chaos. Um, so yeah, I'm a professor at University of Washington of, of statistics and biostatistics, um, and I'm excited to, to answer some questions from Rafa today and from all of you. Right. All right. So the first one, this is a, a, sometimes you see people fighting over this. I don't know how, how useful that is or how, how much it helps, but uh, the, in, in distinguishing machine learning from statistics, what statistics was machine learning? So my first question is, is if is to ask you if you could share your definition of machine learning and how you distinguish it from statistics if you do so. Yeah, so that you're, I totally agree with you that this is sort of like the perpetual fight that will never end over what's statistic and what's machine learning. And I think one thing that sort of confuses things and muddies the water is that there are some topics that most statisticians will say are core statistics like logistic regression. But if you open a machine learning textbook, Often that book will start with logistic regression and that'll be like, you know, the simplest machine learning method is logistic regression. But then a machine learning textbook will take logistic regression and it'll add bells and whistles to that. And eventually it'll end up like in deep learning with neural networks. Um, so a statistician will look at a neural network and they'll be like, hey, that's just like a nonlinear log logistic regression versus a machine learner will say like, no, this is something really new that's inherently really machine learning. So in a way, the distinction between statistics and machine learning, it's not so much like the actual methods that are being used, but it's like the, the viewpoint that we use to get at that method. And again, I really um, think about neural networks as just like the example that sort of epitomizes the difference between statistics and machine learning. Like a neural network, it's just logistic regression with a bunch of nonlinearities. And if I say it like that, I'm saying it as a statistician and I sound really dismissive. But it's a, just a nonlinear logistic regression that's been designed in this really incredible way that's so clever with all of these nonlinearities applied in a very specific way that really exploits um, what we understand about model fitting and, and large data sets and so on in order to get really incredible results. So on the one hand, it's nonlinear logistic regression, but on the other hand, it's like this amazing tool that does so well empirically and the results speak for themselves. And so maybe yeah. this is just a, a long way to answer your question by saying that the difference between machine learning and statistics is, is really more philosophical than anything else, because at the end of the day, a lot of the methods are the same, but how we view them is different. Yeah, that's kind of what I think too. It's, it's not really, so the way I think of that, I distinguish the two, I don't even distinguish them because I, we could argue that one is, is a subset of the other in some sense, but that when you care about prediction and that's your main goal, and not so much about interpreting parameters or performing inference on parameters or whatever. That's that's when I would I would start calling it machine learning, even even if it is logistic regression straight up. If if you're what you're after is the prediction rather than the coefficient estimates, then then I, I would throw that into the machine. No, I'm not sure I would give all of that to machine learning though, Rafa. Like okay. um like you any anything having to do with prediction, you will, you're just gonna give that to machine learning people because that's like a lot any of machine learning people. To be aren't we aren't are you machine learning people? Well no, I'm not no? a core okay. machine learning person. I'm a statistician and I think a lot of that has to do with you know like my my viewpoint. Um so one example of this is I think that like machine learning there's a more algorithmic viewpoint whereas for statistics mm -hmm. there's a more modeling viewpoint. So like I'm happy to end up at a neural network, but if you ask me how I got there, I'm gonna get there through a statistical model and the model will become increasingly complex and then eventually I'm gonna end up at, at deep learning. And if you ask like a machine learning person how they get to deep learning, they're basically gonna draw a picture and then tell you an algorithm. So I, I do right. think that I, there's, there's sort of this philosophical viewpoint, you're getting at the same thing two different ways. Mm, I see, okay, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm thinking more as, an, as, a, as a person who uses tools, um, not necessarily the, the as a person who, who develops the theory and methods for it but 
that's I, I get see. what you're, okay, I so get you're, what you're saying, saying. You're saying that if you're doing, if you like, if you're just like running an algorithm, like you're running an R package and you're trying to do a prediction, then you're like, I did machine learning today. And today was like a great machine learning day. Yes. But if, 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 if a different day you wake up and you're like, today I'm going to run some T tests, then you're like, today I've like really dug in on my statistical expertise. That's right. That's, a, that's right. I'm gonna explain. I'm gonna explain it like that in the future. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You might need. You might need to put like a sign on your door that's like the machine learner is in or the statistician is in, and then you can, you can yeah, it. Sure. Right. And then and then that, that brings me to my next question, which is to, if you have a definition of data science and how you distinguish it from statistics. Is, yeah. Is then we can we can talk about that. We can talk about at least the way I see it, is like if you're the whole the, pr the entire process of getting to an answer from data. Is, is what I call data science, and that can include anything, including building the, the, the database and, and writing the efficient code to extract data from it all the way to, the, to inference or, what, or machine learning results at the end. Yeah, I, uh, I anyway, That's totally my definition, that. I don't, yeah, okay. No, I agree with you. I think data science is much broader than, than either statistics or machine learning. So like you, data science is like everything that happens from like the moment that the data enters the world until like the final thing that happens to that data. And of course, like, you know, from like your many years of expertise working with biologists, that even the notion of like when the data quote unquote enters the world is, is actually not necessarily well defined mm -hmm. because um, so much processing happens. There's so many really complex computational pipelines that might need to happen to the data. And there's also a lot of really simple things that might need to happen, like data cleaning and stuff like that, just harmonizing the data. But that is like a huge part of the story for data science that as a statistician, I sort of haven't really been trained to think about and that it's very easy for statisticians to just forget about because like often what, by the time a statistician enters the story, the data has been cleaned up and it's now like a really nice clean data set that's essentially like a matrix in R or Python or whatever you're using. And so we can forget about all the earlier steps that needed to happen in order to get the data into that form. But I think that entire story from like the moment that the data enters the universe until the final results are obtained on the data, that all counts as part of data science. And so for me, data science is much broader than statistics. Statistics is an absolutely critical part of data science, but it's not the only part. And you need to have people with expertise, like not just in running the t-tests and fitting the neural networks, but also in processing all of that data as it comes in. And uh, what do you call yourself? If you, if I'm a, you oh, I'm a statistician. A statistician, yeah. that's the best one out of all the possibilities, right? Because like you can, um, you like get to tell other people how to analyze their data, which is really fun. You get to look at all different types of data. You're not committed to like one particular area of science unless you want to be. And also like for me, a lot of the, the data science stuff in the pipeline that comes before the statistics is just like frankly not as interesting to me personally. And so what's really fun about being a statistician is I can be like, oh, like that's not the statistics part. Like you need to hire someone to do that part for you. So it's really great. You get to just pick and choose your problems, which is um, always the dream, I think. Okay, so listen up kids. Daniela Witten said it here. Statistics is fun. No, yeah, statistics so is the dream. The dream. The I dream. Said it is. Yeah. Even better. Yeah. 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 So that's um, Tuki said. John Tuki said that I think it was him. If not, somebody mm -hmm. correct me. That, that statisticians get to play in everybody's backyard, and I think that's the, similar to the sentiment you just shared. Right. So now uh, let's get a little bit more into uh, practical decisions as fa as academics. And this is this comes from the audience, from Michael Sachs. What aspects of ML should be incorporated in a general biostat PhD curriculum and how? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think um, we, we need to be honest about the fact that there's only so much curriculum that a PhD student's gonna take. You know, maybe like two years of solid curriculum is all that's really feasible because we also need to leave time for obviously the research part, which is the bulk of a PhD. So what does a, um, what does, should a bias that PhD student have time for? And I, I think that frankly, like one or two quarters or else one semester of like a really solid PhD level machine learning class is a pretty important thing for a bias that PhD to learn because when they go out there in the world, like they're not just going to be fitting Cox models or, you know, like running ANOVAs. Like there are going to be cases where they're going to need to be familiar with a lot of these more contemporary techniques, even if not running them, at least to like understand their pros and cons. And I do frankly think that today it's pretty limiting if you're um, a PhD biostatistician and you like can't have a conversation 
with a collaborator about like whether or not deep learning or something like that is a good choice for their data. So I strongly encourage all of the UW bias at PhD students who I see to take at least a quarter of this really wonderful statistical machine learning sequence that's taught in the stat department, mm -hmm. um, regardless really of research area. And I think about that as just like part of being like an educated bias statistics PhD and just being aware that, you know, as the field changes, it's important for our curriculum to, to be keeping up. Um, and then obviously, if your research is going to be more specialized on that, then you should be taking more courses. So I, I agree. I think I would say more than a quarter. I, I mean, it should should be one of the, I think, incorporate into the core somehow. Um, inclu included in the linear regression part, for example, you can use you can use your book. Uh, we'll talk about that later, or the or the more advanced one. T as, as well, a, the, the way that I see it also is like, what, well, what's the point of a PhD? Like at, in a PhD, you're not supposed to learn everything because there's an infinite amount to learn. And also a lot of the things you'll need over the course of your career haven't been developed yet. So the point of a PhD is like to learn how to learn. So I kind of think that like, hopefully like a well-designed quarter or semester course should be enough in machine learning that you, now you, you've learned how to learn, you know how to read papers. You could read another textbook when another textbook is written. Um, but to have absolutely no exposure, I think is a pity. Yeah, yeah. At least get the the general ideas of of what what we mean by prediction and what's cross validation and right. and that sort of thing. Some of the basic algorithms. Good. Okay. So um, I think there's there, and I, I suspect you agree that there's a lot of hype around machine learning, and um, and or as it's called when it's really being hyped, AI. Hi, however, I'm also a big fan of some of the substantive work going on in the field and also some of the applications. Now, can you share some of your favorite examples of applications of machine learning? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, in the last eight or so years, some of the applications that we've seen that have made it into commercial use have just been incredible. So, for example, like speech recognition, mm -hmm. um, natural language processing, um, machine translation, the idea that we have self-driving cars, I mean, like if you'd asked me five years ago how long it would be until there are self-driving cars in the streets of San Francisco, uh, I would have, let's just say I would have been like very wrong. Um, so I think a lot of these applications of machine learning are just stunning and spectacular. Now I'll tell you where I am a little bit underwhelmed and that's what hits a little bit closer to home is applications like in biomedical research and health. And, you know, it seems like there's constantly new papers getting published in, in shiny journals talking about, you know, using machine learning to solve some important problem like cancer diagnosis or whatever it is, um, image processing and so on in medicine. And those results, I, I find it a little bit hard to um, be too convinced by them. And I think part of the issue is that the bar is really high because like in order for one of these like ML or AI systems to be really useful, like in a, in a clinical setting, it has to be better than a doctor because um, you like you're not going to put a human's life in the hands of a machine learning algorithm without at least having a doctor double check it. And so if it's doing worse than a doctor and the doctor is double checking it, then I just don't necessarily see like what value add this is providing. And I think inherently it's really hard to make machine learning super useful for biomedicine or for health. Um, because your sample sizes aren't there, right? Like if you're Google and you're trying to come up with like an awesome machine translation service, you have a corpus that's, you know, absolutely humongous of essentially everything that's ever been written. But um, well, that's just not available in the same way in biomedicine. I, I would say that that's definitely one reason, but I, I would say the main reason is that biology and the human body are much more complex than say writing you know auto correcting or, or the other example you gave it's mm -hmm. there's even in the best case scenario you're you're not necessarily going to be predicting a, a high rate at a high at high accuracy so you know you can get if you can get to in some examples if you can get to 80 percent right here it's like a humongous advance well i think we should think about it though in terms of what would a human do though right so like mm -hmm. this an example where if an ml system could get to 80 percent, that would be a huge advance is your assumption that a human would be 85 or a human would be 75 yeah, no, I, I, that's right. So that's, that's what I'm saying is like that's probably why it's um, because you can't really get to that point where it, it gets it gets as good as 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 what you as you see in other machine learning applications and people hype it up or even try to you know they they they, they due to publication bias ends up publishing the one that forgot to do cross validation right or something right. in some cases. No, I, I agree. 
Well, I think another way to view kind of what you're saying is that maybe is sort of a helpful way to frame it that I hadn't thought of until you said that is if you think about like a self-driving car, like they're doing something that's incredibly hard, right? They have like, you know, all of these different technologies that are allowing them to measure all these things that are coming in in order to sort of see what the, what the risks are on the road ahead of them. And then if God forbid something goes wrong and the car hits something that it shouldn't have hit, then like people can go through and they can look again and they can be like, okay, the problem was that like at this angle, we weren't able to see this thing. So now we can fix our algorithm. Mm -hmm. And so basically they can iteratively troubleshoot the problem, but it's harder to iteratively troubleshoot in biomedicine or public health or rather in biomedicine or health, because we don't actually know the gold standard. Like there's not, it's not like a doctor can come in and be like, oh, okay, like, you know, the, the, the tumor was missed because actually we should have been able to see that this cell over here in the next however many months was going to progress because we don't actually know that. There isn't a gold standard in the same way. That too, and but, what, make it but really what, hard. that too, but what the, the other point I'm making is that Bayes rule, the best possible answer right. is not great sometimes in but why in i don't under i don't totally understand that point though because okay so let's what say i'm that, saying is like if you have even with all the covariates and they all if you, yeah. you can have two people with exactly the two same covariates and they'll and, yeah. and they'll have different results so you can't predict yeah, them I, both right yeah i totally agree with that and that's the the irreducible error that comes up like in all areas of machine learning but the part that i'm struggling with is you don't need to get a 100 percent result in order for a system to be useful it just has to be like better than a doctor right or at least as good as a doctor sure i get what so, you're saying so yeah. so like the doctor is also facing that irreducible error so that's why uh, like if if a doctor is at 80 percent, but we got an ml system that was at 80.5 percent, that would be super useful right yeah um, yes I, I get what you're saying i i i'm not i'm not saying they're they're it's one or the other i'm saying that that those are there are two reasons there are two separate reasons why it's right. not as 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 a, as a popular and it is popular. It's not as as a successful, successful. to date, yeah. right? But yeah. you know, maybe this is going to be like the self driving cars, right? If you'd asked me this however many years ago, I would have said no way, um, and I was. No, oh, absolutely. Um, I so. think then in radiology, I, I'm sorry, all the radiologists listening might become pretty automated in, in, in not so distant future. Do so you think that radiology will actually be automated or do you think there will just of, be like computer assistance systems that will like help of, a radiologist figure out what to look at? I think some of it might become automated. Some of it. Yeah. But mm -hmm. we'll see. It's not, it's not a for sure a prediction. All right. So now we talked, that's, those are the applications. Now, can you say a little bit about theoretical and methodological work in machine learning? Yeah. Well, listen, Rafa, I'm glad that I'm protected by my screen so you can't throw tomatoes at me because I know you're not always a you're not always a big fan of theory but I do think that theory is really important here and I, I mean I'm, I'm not a theorist at all like in any way but I like to know that theory is being developed so that we can understand what's happening because we can take some phenomena like here's here's one example again going back to machine learning since that's the topic of today so we know about the bias variance trade-off and we've we've seen that you can see me making a u-shaped curve in the air We've seen the bias variance trade-off for a long time and that kind of explains what what we think should happen as we start to overfit our data but then we've also seen in the last few years that the bias variance trade-off doesn't actually hold and it's not necessarily the regime that we're in in a lot of settings, in particular with deep learning. Like we can get into a setting known as double descent, where as you start to interpolate your training data, you can actually sort of paradoxically start to get better and better results, even though that's not what the bias variance trade-off tells us. And at first glance, that really doesn't make any sense. So in order to understand this double descent phenomenon, we can just like empirically like run simulations and try to see when it's happening. But then we end up a little bit like cargo cult scientists where we, we see what's happening and we try to like put together a postdoc explanation, but we don't really get it. Or we can have someone um, prove some theorems for us that explain sort of theor the theoretical framework in which this phenomenon is happening. So that number one, we understand it. And number two, we can systematically exploit it. So I think that theory is really important, but I have a personal preference for theory that ties into methodology and application in a clear way. Mm -hmm. so let me uh, let me clear that up. I actually am also a big fan of theory and methodology for the same reasons you explained. I guess what you're referring to is my defense of, of applied statisticians in academia, where I think that the balance is a little bit off and where we have yeah. too many of one and, and too few of the others. Yeah, oh no, I think that's true. I mean, I definitely think that um, we, we definitely need to have a lot of applied scientists. And I think for all the theorists out there who don't necessarily see the value of applied scientists, I would ask them to just take a second and just think, like what have the big questions in statistics been for the last 
20, let's say 25 years. And how does that tie into application? So I can only go back 25 years because um, I, I don't think I have insight into the field maybe before the mid nineties, but starting in the mid nineties, people were really interested in like multiple testing and false discovery rate. And that's not just, those weren't just like theoretical ideas that came out in a vacuum. Those were theoretical ideas that were driven by application as things like microarrays started to come out and multiple testing became more and more important in biology, that led to like a huge area of theoretical and methodological research and statistics. And then after that died down, we got into like sparsity and lasso. And again, it was very, very clear that there was an application that was driving all that research. Then more recently, people got into um, um, inference in the high dimensional setting. Once again, very, very clearly driven by application. So like this theory isn't operating in a vacuum or it shouldn't be. This theory should be motivated by these applied questions and all those theorists out there, just like I think that applied people need the theorists in order to help them understand some of the phenomena they're observing and in order to help them know how to analyze the data in a similar way. I think that the theorists do need the applied people to help them figure out what theorems to prove because not all theorems are equally useful or important, right? Exactly, so I think yeah. that that's, um, we need to have them both. We need to have them in close quarters and certainly academic departments should be finding a way to value both. Absolutely. Like the close quarter thing is a tricky one, right? Cause you could say, so one argument for having stat departments being more he theory heavy is because where else are they going to go? Right. As, as opposed to apply statuses, we have a ton of places where we can go, not just academia. So it's good to have a place where they can be and do the thing. But the problem is if they're, as you pointed out, if they're in a bubble and they don't actually get to get access to people who know what's important or can keep them from making uh, working on things that are useless and nobody's going to care about, then then it's it might be a problem. So it's basically yeah. So I'm basically agreeing with you. So th let me ask you a related question that's coming from someone from the audience, Mark Axon. Um, what are some of the areas of ML that are currently underhyped? which will no longer be in five years. Oh God, an that's area <laughs> of ML that's under hype that will no longer be in five years. Oh gosh, um, that is really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pump that one back to you, Rafa. That's really hard. <laughs> Let me tell you, like, that's like saying, where's like the lowest hanging fruit? And mm -hmm. I, like, you would, you would be working on question. it. Yeah, exactly. Like all my grad students would be doing that. So I think, isn't that kind of what we're all trying to figure out every day is like, what is the lowest hanging fruit that we can set our students to work on? That's right. I, I, I think that's right. I mean, the only thing that kind of comes to mind is feature selection, but like there's a lot of engineering. What do they call it? Um, feature engineering. Like feature engineering. Is that what you mean? Yeah, but that, that the theory, theorists haven't, I don't know, maybe not having gotten into that as much as, as the applied people. But I, that's right. I mean, to, to answer Mark's question, that's that's a that's a question a lot of people in academia would want to answer and don't really yeah necessarily know. Great. Okay, um, let me see. Should I ask? I'll ask that in a second. Uh, all right. So where was I? I'm sorry. All right. So um, I'm currently reading a paper of yours. And we're using it for some of the work we're doing. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this opportunity to apologize to you for something I said, I don't know, 15 years ago. You were, you were just starting, or you were still a student, and you were, I think you were working on this paper. This is the classification and clustering. I'm gonna go ahead and say, Rafa, I remember the comments. Oh so I'm God. excited for you to tell 194 people. <laughs> but uh, actually, yeah. I value it. No, I value it very much. So I'd love to hear it again. <laughs> So anyways, you were very excited about this using Poisson and I'm like, ah, oh, just take the log. Um, but yeah, I was wrong about that. I'm glad you worked on it anyways. I'm glad you ignored me. And uh, and now we're using it. In RNA-seq, maybe it wasn't as a big deal, but for single cell data, it's, it's, it's important. And, and what I'm talking about is Daniela has a paper. How old is this? 15 years ago? No, it just, it's, no. it's like 2011 or something. Yeah. 2011. Okay, sorry. Nine years ago. So... Uh, where where she uses Poisson to to do clustering because the data is this is counts they're not they're not um, continuous data and in some of the, the, the things I'm working on now is very very sparse Poisson data where you really can't use the, the the usual distance definitions and things like PCA so do you want to share your that's my favorite of your your contributions do you want to share your favorite theoretical contribution to the field. 
Well, I first wanted to say, so Rafi gave me this comment. It was like right after I started my job at UW and he, he asked me what I was working on. And I told him I was working on this paper and he's like, oh, you know, like probably before you start working on something too much, like it's good to check like how well it works in practice. And of course, like well, now that I say it like that, that's completely obvious advice. Like why on earth would you spend a year on something without like checking how well it works? And like, should he even have had to say that? But I've often felt like often in my life, I've like gotten very casual feedback like that, like that feedback from Rafa that's really useful and that I always remember and that I like try to apply to every project that I do and that I try to explain to all my students because it's so easy to find yourself like waist deep in a project and then you're like, oh, maybe I should like run a simulation and if only I had a time machine that could set me back to 12 months, you know? Um, so I thought it was great advice. Um, I'll, I will tell you some stuff that I've been working on more recently um, with a couple of students is sort of this idea of the fact that often in statistics, we do this types of exploratory data analyses um, in order to sort of, for example, maybe cluster our data, see if there's clusters there. And if you find clusters in your data, then the next thing you want to know is, are these clusters real? Is there really a difference in the means between the clusters? But immediately, like you're in a bind and your hands are kind of tied because you already peeked at your data to find the clusters. So then it's hard to like get p-values for those clusters. And you can try to come up with some kind of a hack, but it's very challenging. Um, and this is something where like everybody who does clustering encounters this problem where like you get clusters and you're like, okay, like now what, are they real? And so I have a student now who's working on um, selective inference for clustering where she does hierarchical clustering and then she um, tries to get a p-value to test the hypothesis that the clusters are really different given that those clusters were estimated on the exact same data. Um, and so that's a piece of work that I really like because it kind of hits the sweet spot that I'm interested in where there's like a real applied problem that you can explain to like a, a biologist or a non-statistician and they're like, oh yeah, like that is a problem. I would like p-values for my clusters, but then also the statistical solution is not obvious. I mean, clustering has been around forever. So if it were easy to solve this problem, it would have been solved. Um, but it turns out that we can bring in other tools from other areas of statistics that have been developed more recently to try to answer this. So That's I great. really like projects that bring in, you know, like applied theory methods, everything all at once. So we're stuck on that right now too. So I'm glad to hear that. I'll be checking out uh, what oh, comes yeah. out. So totally yeah, we're de we're stuck on, on a problem like that. I don't know if you've seen these single cell atlases. Uh huh. I mean, there's like I think what we what we think me and this and a student, uh, Izzy, Grabsky is it, it, we've been working on this and. We both think that the, there's many more clusters being reported than there really are. It's like they call them new cells, right? Uh, but it's it's exactly the the problem you just described. Yeah. Um, so I mean, if those if those clusters were determined using hierarchical clustering, then you could uh, directly apply our thing. And if it's not hierarchical clustering, then I think we probably have like an important sampling type approach. So we'd love to talk with you more about okay. um, that area. I'll I'll be in touch. So um. Yeah. I'm gonna ask this one now. I don't know where else to stick it in, but an audience, so David Bellamy from the audience is asking, what are your thoughts on the relevance of causal inference to ML and vice versa and the future of that intersection? I have, I am seeing a lot of activity in that, in that, in that realm, but I, I myself ask myself, I, I myself am wondering what is the big deal? Yeah, well, I think, I think it's great that like ML people are starting to realize that um, prediction isn't enough. Right. I mean, it's, it's great to predict the response that you're interested in, but at the same time, we should understand why things are the way they are instead of just predicting what they're going to be. Um, so I, I really applaud people for getting involved in that intersection. Um, what I will say as an outsider to that area is it seems really hard because I feel like usually when I attend talks on causal inference, it seems like the, the underlying assumptions that they're making are simultaneously critical to all of their downstream conclusions and also usually very simple, like simple assumptions about linearity and independence and that type mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm interested in seeing how this is going to mesh with sort of more sophisticated machine learning models and what they'll really be able to get if they're simultaneously making these really simplifying assumptions, but also applying pretty complex models. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Next question. So you're the co-author of one of, the, if not the most popular machine learning textbook. And my favorite thing about this textbook is that it explains algorithms in statistical probabilistic in a statistical or probabilistic framework, and I've noticed that in in CS, when some of the some of these methods are originally de developed by people in CS, they don't always use this approach. They they 
they describe them in, in another way. And I, I find it really hard to understand their algorithms and sometimes in the original paper. So then I, when I go into the, uh, your book and, and, and the other more advanced one, um, I finally understand it. So do you, do you find this to be true as well for you or do you, or you, are you, or do you, are you able to read those other papers and, and get that you collaborate and talk to people in CS yeah. that lets you get a better feel for what they're actually doing? How are those interactions? So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm like you, I think about things first and foremost from first a statistical model, then an optimization problem and then an algorithm. And I totally agree with you that a lot of computer scientists, start in the other direction like they'll first put it together an algorithm and then you're like okay but like what's this an algorithm for like literally like what what does this algorithm solve is there an optimization problem so to me it does feel really backwards often but i will say that the times that i have successfully gotten into that mindset i can appreciate its power and yeah. sorry to keep bringing up this example of neural networks but like if you think about a neural net as a statistical model with layer upon layer, it gets pretty complicated and sort of halfway through, you're like, okay, like, I don't believe this model, like this model is implausible. But if instead you, you just suspend your disbelief and you're like, here's a picture and I'm gonna apply back propagation with stochastic gradient descent as a way to fit this picture basically, mm -hmm. and it's gonna just give me an algorithm, that's the algorithm that I'm gonna do on my data, it sort of allows you to like make that cognitive leap that gives you these incredible results. Yeah, and that's so right. But I you just it did it. Really you, you just did it again. You just explained it in a statistical way. It's just well, some okay. function and that's listen, there. We're, right now, my co-authors and I are we're working on the second edition, which has a, a chapter on deep learning. So that's why, like, that explanation is really fresh in my mind. But I, I don't think that. No, what you're saying is that we thinking the way we think, we probably wouldn't have gotten to that algorithm. It's only after I, somebody I else comes up. I mean, I yeah, would I not have, I would not have gotten to it and I wouldn't have pushed through all the bells and whistles that have been pushed through in order to get the really amazing results that people have gotten because yeah. I would have at a certain point, I would have been like, this model's too much. Like I'm done yeah. with this model. But instead, if you just abstract it, you just think about the algorithm, then it's like the algorithm's not that hard. It's just stochastic gradient descent. Like, let's just keep going. Yeah. So I think there is some power in sometimes starting with the algorithm, yeah. but, but you should understand both directions, right? It's not enough to only understand one. All right, so what I have a question here about Bayesian and, and frequentists, which hasn't come up in yet in this uh, Zoom hour, so maybe this is the time to bring it up for the first time. So what, this is from the audience. When is it useful to think like a frequentist and when to think at, like a Bayesian? How do the two camps start to blend together? I think we already blended together, but go ahead. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I do think that we blend together pretty well, so I'll just speak for myself personally. Like, I really... Um, I value simplicity. And so often for me, like a frequentist way of thinking things just feels a little simpler. And like, do I really need like, you know, hyperparameters and layer upon layer in my model if I can just think about it a little more simply. But on the other hand, sometimes I need to be a Bayesian. Like it would be really silly if I, you know, for a particular question I'm trying to answer, if I acted like the data set that I have now is like the only data ever having been collected in the entire universe for this problem, because I would be, um, you know, it would be like a horse with blinders. It wouldn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm very pragmatic about it. It depends on the problem that I'm solving, but with an eye on like, what's the simplest way to answer the question that I want to answer. That's, I, I agree. So Jake, if you're listening, um, I don't, we don't, I don't think we and Daniela agree that it really aren't necessarily two camps, at least definitely among applied people, uh, people who are just analyzing data and coming up with solutions to real world problems. Well, maybe I should just speak for myself, but I, I, I've used the statistics as, as statistics as a big toolbox. Some, some have one level models, two, three level models. And sometimes you think one is a better solution there. You just pick whatever works. Uh, but I know there's also a philosophical debate that we're maybe not getting into here, but that's my view. I actually wrote a blog post of declaring the, the end of the war. Um, you're yeah. like you've like brokered peace it's like peace in the middle east but mm -hmm. peace between um bayesians and frequentists i think you're a hero rafa oh thank you i agree <laughs> just kidding yeah. so all right so we're we're past the 30 minute mark but i i do want to ask you one last question um two if you don't mind because actually sure. we haven't had anybody leave really so um you have talked about this a little bit but maybe this i think would help other other more uh, early career scientists and you want to follow in your footsteps. How do you decide what you work on and how do you divide your time? Yeah, I think that, um, I think like a lot of people think that there's some like big strategy to like what it takes to succeed or at least survive in academia. 
And let me tell you, like, I don't have a strategy. My, or I do have a strategy. My strategy is like low hanging fruit first. So my strategy is like, I'm not going to choose like the hardest problem so that I can prove to people how smart I am. Instead, I'm going to choose the problem that the least amount of my effort can have the biggest amount of impact. And at the end of the day, isn't that what we should all be doing? Like, I'm not going to choose the project that like in five years might give me a paper that'll impress everybody. If I can write that same really awesome paper in a much more low hanging way, that'll take me like three months. So I, I just, I think that this is important advice for junior faculty because I often see people and they're like, oh yeah, I don't want to write that paper because I do think it would be a really good paper, but I don't think people would be like that impressed with like the technical difficulty. And it's like, come on, that shouldn't be your marker. Like you shouldn't be choosing projects to impress people with how smart you are. You should be choosing projects to get like the most awesome result that's going to have as high impact, which may be related to how smart you are, or it might just have to do with how good you are at choosing problems. And, and it, might, it might come later. That's another thing that we can't forget. Like, you know, I mean, we just talked about an example. The impact, is that what you mean? The impact, yeah, the impact won't right? necessarily come right away. Yeah. Well, I think there's, a, and there's another thing too, which is, this is just advice to like everybody who's starting on their career. I think it's really easy to end up in a situation where like you have a whole folder on your computer with like 37 projects that are all half done. And don't be that person. Like if there's a good reason that you've put in a lot of work to a project and then now you know more and you're older and wiser and it's not worth finishing, then okay. But don't let that be your, um, you know, your modus operandi for just like most of your papers because it's really hard to sort of have an impact in your field if you like, if you like starting projects but you don't like finishing them. You need to uh -huh. realize that like a lot of the work is actually finishing the project and we often see like, you know, junior faculty who um, are getting close to their, their promotion and tenure deadline. And they have like 15 really awesome projects, all of which could be great papers, but then they only have like one publication from their time as junior faculty. And it's like, hey, like half the battle, maybe two thirds of the battle is getting it across the finish line. And you just have to do that. You have to, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so any last words for all the data scientists listening out there? Well, it's a, it's a fun time to be doing what you're doing. Um, and I, I wish you all the best. Thanks for tuning in. All right, great.